Welcome to Pop Psych 101, where we, licensed therapist Ryan Engelstad and licensed psychologist Dr. Haley Roberts, break down and analyze how mental health is represented in movies, shows, books, and across the pop culture and social media landscape. We will determine what lines up with real life and what is just pop culture fantasy. This is Pop Psych 101. Welcome back to Pop Psych 101. I am licensed therapist Ryan Engelstad. Here as always with my co-host, Dr. Haley Roberts. That's me. That's you. Hello, <laughs> Haley. How are you? Hello. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. i excited once again to be talking about mental health and pop culture. And boy, do we have a wild ride for our audience today. Yep. There's literally no other way to describe it. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about the Showtime series Yellow Jackets and you know it's a story about survival in in many ways and it got me thinking you know the sort of standard like survival hypothetical questions you ask as like uh -huh. an icebreaker you know the sort of stereotypical one being like oh if you were stranded on a desert island you know how would you survive or what would you need and you know in these characters in yellow jackets all kind of have their little comfort thing you know a character has a stuffed animal or journals or a little thing of hard liquor probably so i was thinking you know Haley, let's just assume you had all the things you needed to survive on a desert island mm -hmm. what things let's say between one and three things would you want to help you pass the time like what would your things that be that you would hope to pull out of your suitcase to you know make surviving a little bit more uh, enjoyable for yourself totally What's so funny is when you first asked the question, you had said, like, you have the very basics for survival. What would you want? And my brain immediately went, yeah. like, what would make survival even more comfortable <laughs> was, like, my reaction. I was like, okay. blankets. Sure. But the way that you worded it now, it's more kind of like you got all that stuff. <laughs> so kind of how the yellow jackets are now, right? They've got a cabin with supplies and all that stuff. Yeah. What extras would you want? So I think the first thing that comes to mind is a pack of cards. I nice and the and the group does find one but it's missing missing something yeah <laughs> is it yeah I think the 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 reference was like oh it's missing you know the queen of diamonds or something somebody pulled oh, a card a uh, pack of cards out at some point oh that's funny I didn't even notice that um yeah so a pack of cards is definitely something oh, yeah. that I would want I would want so I'm guessing if I was traveling I would have a kindle that was just like packed with books I haven't read and I don't need Wi-Fi for those books because they will just already be on the Kindle. So that'll be really nice. <laughs> and then who, what's a third thing? Um, I don't know. Sunscreen. <laughs> Sunscreen. So that that's, that's like the one, thing. like make the survival a little bit more bearable thing. Yeah, totally. I'm very white and I burn very easily and I am very gentle with my skin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I always think like you watch Survivor and over time, like they all, you know, just develop a really uh, intense tan and, yeah. you know, kind of adapt to it one way yeah. or the other. Yeah, but I'd I'm like sure to it's get painful, there slowly. But it happens. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. What about you? What do you think is going to make your survival more comfortable? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely relate to Shauna and wanting to have something to record, like, all of my thoughts and feelings and experiences. Like, um, Yeah, I think so, too. I have a tiny little journal from, um, like, the course of time over which my daughter was born. Uh -huh. And it doesn't live in one place. It just is in one of my bags. And then I'll, like, randomly find it when we're traveling. And it's just, like, so funny to look back on, like, Oh, like we watched Frozen. Oh, we did this. Yeah. Oh, this happened at that time. Uh -huh. So like having that, to, you know, record and look back on all the probably crazy things that would happen yeah. while I'm trying to survive Absolutely. would be really valuable for me. And also just I being like able... the Kindle idea. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Just being able to write down the facts of what is happening yep. in a situation like that mm -hmm. would be so meaningful and 
you know, it's one of those reasons why therapists are always been like, do you journal? <laughs> what I will often say to people, it's like, write it down and then burn it. Like, I don't care what you do, but put it on paper first. And I do think there's really something powerful about literally just writing down like, plane crashed. We found these things. These two people got in a fight. Here's the thing that happened. End of day. Like there's just so much processing that happens just by like kind of getting that out. That would be a really good survival technique. Like you said, you know, if you burn it, I don't know if that I would necessarily need to keep it, but just that feeling of like, I am experiencing this, this is real. Because I have to imagine these sorts of scenarios, like it's just this constant state of shock and acceptance, yeah. shock, acceptance, yeah. that grounding yourself in like a constant recorded version of your experiences is something I would need to be doing. Other than that, like, I feel like I would need something that I, you know, kind of like the the pack of cards, but I would need something that I could make a game out of. I don't know if that's like, a really durable ball that I could use for different purposes or use a pine cone as a ball. Um, this is where what's that? Pack, you can use a pine cone as a ball. <laughs> no, no, you no, it's that's like not good. Enough. With a stick and pine cone. <laughs> yeah, no, it would need to be something something more substantial. I don't know. That that's one of the things that popped in my head. I considered a frisbee. Oh, so frisbee's good. Frisbee's pretty good, and frisbee you could also be a plate. So that That's is a very um, diverse, <laughs> and yeah. multifaceted. Wear this hat to protect your gentle skin from the sun. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah, and then you know, and then you're thinking about that, and then it's like, oh well, what's something else that you could play with, but that also would be functional? And my head went to yo-yo. I don't know why. I don't really do a lot of yo-yoing, but well, yo-yos like, were originally weapons. That's right. So like whether it was a weird weapon or just something that had a durable string and something to hold on to, you know, and then maybe I teach myself a bunch of yo-yo tricks. Yeah. <laughs> just imagine you yo-yoing and journaling. Or I just become the really annoying guy in the group who's like constantly doing yo-yo. And it does definitely change what you want. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody's like, look at this new yo-yo trick. Everyone's like, we don't care. Yeah. It does change whether you're in a group or um, individually oh, as 100%, well. Yeah. yeah. I think, no, I think I would still want the books. I need my alone time. I would like go into the back room and just like hide in a book by myself, but like leave me alone. It's so funny. Well, yeah. And like, you know, and obviously we'll talk about some of these characters' experiences, but, but right. But if like, would I journal if I was part of a group, right? Would I... Would I want to be the weird yo-yo guy if I was part of a group versus like playing cards, more inclusive, more interactive with other people, most likely? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all sorts of fascinating dynamics that we are going to dive into right after this break. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Haley. Uh, you want to hear about a really interesting podcast recommendation for you and our listeners today? I love podcast recommendations. Hit me. What do you got? Awesome. So Pretty Much Pop is a culture podcast. They talk about TV, movies, music, games, podcasts, novels, comedy, theater. They explore why and how we consume these things. They ask, how does pop culture even work in a world that is so fragmented and so connected? Where's the line between trash and treasure? These are all the questions that they ask. Sound pretty interesting, right? I'm, I'm hooked. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> uh, pretty much pop brings together philosophers, artists, comedians, and other smart folks to attempt and ponder these questions. Most of what people like is pretty weird when you think about it. And you and I explore that a lot on our episodes. And thinking about it is what pretty much pop does. Wow. Well, I, I am so excited to be sharing our listeners uh, more podcasts that do fun stuff like what we do. So yeah. if the listeners are interested, they can find Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast, wherever they listen to their favorite podcast or find it at prettymuchpop.com. Yay! Pop Psych 101 discusses mental health as it is portrayed in pop culture media. And because of this, we often cover sensitive topics that can be triggering for some listeners. We also delve into the characters and plots of these stories, and therefore, spoilers abound. So please, use your discretion as you listen to the rest of the episode. Y 
Yellow Jackets is a Showtime streaming series that tells the narrative of a team of wildly talented high school girl soccer players based in New Jersey, by the way, who survive a plane crash deep in the Ontario wilderness. The series chronicles their descent from a complicated but thriving team to potentially, in the future, warring clans while also tracking the lives they have attempted to piece back together. And that is where we are introduced to some of our main characters, um, including, let's see, if we go through the team, we have Lottie and Misty and Van, Jackie and Shauna and Nat and some others. I am sure. Yes, <laughs> uh, it's a full soccer team. And not only that, we have the coach and the assistant coach, at least at the beginning, and the coach's sons. And that kind of rounds out the, the crew that is tasked to survive this incredibly traumatic plane crash in the middle of the Ontario wilderness, in which I'm reading for the first time. I knew it was somewhere in Canada, but there you go, Ontario. That's funny. I just like never thought about it. I was like, I wonder where they are. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of where they are, it's so funny because after we watched the first episode, I told uh -huh. you like, oh, my God, this show is like based on, you know, a, a fictional town in New Jersey. And they were like showed pictures from real places in New Jersey. And then the second episode's intro immediately like dropped all that stuff. Like uh, yeah. they they adopted all the like the very weird intro that I skipped over for the rest of the series. Yeah. Which is obviously what made it harder to watch for me that I didn't have any personal connection to it. <laughs> You're like, oh, this is not where I live. <laughs> That's right. But where they live, uh, both in fictional town in New Jersey and in uh, survival in the middle of Ontario, and then later as adults, we get these very, very different pictures of, you know, uh, pre-trauma life, mid-trauma life, and then post-trauma life, Haley. And one of the first themes that you identified in in our notes was this story of um, like the psychology of survival in general. And we're going to be jumping around in the plot of season one of Yellow Jackets. So this is not going to be a narrative podcast by any means. And of course, spoiler alert. Yeah. Our conversation will look a lot like the show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll jump around character to character. So as we start to do that here, you know, even just the sort of broad theme of the psychology of survival and how these, yeah. these different characters are adapting to this trauma both in the immediate aftermath when we see the plane crash and then later as adults we get these wildly different responses right and especially with our our sort of four main characters that we follow as adults with shauna ty misty and nat mm -hmm. and we there may be some other characters who survive but at least the season one focused on just these four adults mm -hmm. some wildly different scenarios in which they are surviving and adapting so i thought Haley, maybe we could kind of go through at least these four adults one at a time and then uh kind of jump around from there yeah what i was thinking just kind of like in general about the psychology of survival is you kind of mentioned yeah different phases and and as you were talking i was like how many stages would i guess now i want to make it very clear this made me very interested in the psychology of survival i don't actually know the psychology of survival but i was thinking there would be the immediate aftermath right so like right as the of plane course. goes down how do we figure things out then i'm guessing there's the survival of like okay we might be here for a while then i think it settles into long-term survival then i'm guessing there's reintroduction psychology right like when you get back and then the aftermath was kind of like yeah. my guess of how things go. We know nothing about when they get reintroduced because that's never even like alluded to in the show. Right. And we only sort of slightly get hints of like the sustained survival. And that's when they're like hinting at like the clans, like the Lord of the Flies ritual kind of stuff. Yeah. So mostly what we end up seeing is the immediate aftermath the like, okay, we might be here for a while, and then the like long term after survive after they've been found or made it back or whatever long term uh, living, I suppose. Yeah. So so right, there are I think um, some broad stages that you mentioned that I think, and the immediate aftermath is the one that I'm I'm sort of drawn to, right? Because 
we, we think of like being in a state of shock and just sort of like chaos. And we see, you know, the girls kind of running around and some girls are just sort of very stuck in the moment or stuck in the, the physical pain or emotional pain of what has just happened to them. And others are immediately going into, you know, a, a very sort of active, like problem solving mode. Mm-hmm. Like I'm thinking about Misty in particular, who immediately is doing first aid and is collecting supplies and is, is checking on everyone. Preparing for her whole life. Yeah. And you're like, oh my God, Misty's killing this. Like what a great leader to have. <laughs> She's a leader is one word. <laughs> well, at least initially, you know, and, and, and we see the other girls being kind of grateful for some of these skills she had. And she, you know, the, the, she jokes, it's like, Misty, how do you know all this stuff? And she's like, oh, I, I took infant CPR twice, which maybe should have been a warning sign for us. Like, what kind of person? Interesting. I mean, okay. I took it twice, but that's because I've been in childcare multiple for well, my right. whole life. Well, right. <laughs> no, I know. But it was like, you know, as we were introduced to this character, yeah. we, we sort also, of, like, what, you know, started to get a sense time? of how deep it went for her. Yeah. yeah. She, and she's like young at the time. Yeah. So let's kind of, we can either start with Misty or we can kind of start with that period of survival. Yeah. So that, that period of survival, you know, when you're let's say looking at these girls in the immediate aftermath of this plane crash. Cause for me, it's like, kind of like what you said, like, okay, we just got through this. How long, and and you see within like, I don't know, 20 minutes or maybe a couple hours after they've all kind of recovered from the immediate, you know, they're all essentially alive. Um, It's like, Oh, you know, they'll surely rescue us within a day or two. Right. So it's like the sort of self-talk, and and group mentality kicks in of how do we maintain hope kind of during these circumstances? Uh huh. Well, and also not only hope, but how do we sustain life in this moment as well? Like, I think that's Absolutely. almost, yep. I think hope is more important during that second stage, right? Like the, okay, we're not going to be totally. found for a while. That first stage of like, basically what's happening. Like we've just landed here. What's happening I don't think there's much space for emotionality in that moment other than shock and the associated emotions, yeah. whether that comes out as anger or laughter or tears or action, like yeah. however it comes out, it's kind of like just this immediate, yeah, this like immediate action. I definitely found that like, so I think it was the first night they were all like around the campfire and they were like laughing yep. at something mm-hmm. that Laura Lee had said. Well, right. And, Cause she started off with blaming herself for yeah. the plane crash. Yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. Which I think made sense for her character as well. And, and like her belief mm-hmm. system. But I think what was interesting was I was like, I, at my first reaction was, I don't think this would happen. And then I was like, actually, I think it very well might. Right. Like, I think at that point, like, you've kind of sustained people as much as you can, right? Like, done the medical mm-hmm. care that you can where you can. You've Chop the leg to... off, no big deal. Oh, just some, something you had to do, which she did. <laughs> but also, like, she whoa. Did. Yeah. And then I was like, you know, this is actually a group of girls mm-hmm. who yep. are used to relying on each other even if they don't like each other very much and they're like used to having light-hearted conversations in tough situations and spending a lot of time together working as a team and so I was like you know that very well could have happened like I remember times and this is absolutely not similar um, but times when like my soccer team we had like traveled far and then lost and then that bus ride back like you're not happy but everybody nope. kind of like manages to find a little bit of joy in places and i'm like i think that does happen with a team like this um so that was one of my thoughts well you know i i, I really appreciate that that framework because i think we do see that in therapy quite often and you'll hear terms get thrown around like you know incongruent mood and things like that and it's basically you know when someone is talking about something that you might assume is is sad or scary or painful, but they're laughing or smiling or making jokes about it. And 
our ability as therapists to kind of point that out to them, not in a way that's like, hey, this is like wrong, but like, hey, you're talking about this, but I see this this is your emotional reaction. Like, does that how you feel about it? Or does this feel like, you know, the way you want to think about it or a more comfortable way to think about it? Um, So I think that's exactly what's going on. And we, and juxtaposing that sort of first night at the fire with the sort of previous to the, the plane crash um, sort of fight that they all got in at the party where, you know, they're all fighting each other. They're all kind of in a bad mood after, you know, uh, Ty had, somewhat unintentionally uh, broken the leg of the the freshman call up girl. And then uh, Jackie sort of rallies them together and they're talking about their positive qualities. And then they're making jokes, even though they all just kind of almost had a, like a fist fight with each other. So I think that very much is like this group's dynamic is this is how they connect with each other, even under the worst circumstances. As somebody who played competitive soccer at that age, I was like, the way they have depicted this team is so accurate. I was very impressed with that because, yeah, it was just super accurate. I was like, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly how it felt to be on a team like this. (laughs) Well, yeah. And like the group dynamics were consistent, you know, pre-plane crash, post-plane crash. Like there are little mini clicks. There are mini uh, friendships, relationships that are, are hidden, you know, and, and within those different relationships, there's conflict, there's tension, there's romantic feelings. Um, so it's that they're navigating that pre, you know, trauma and post trauma. And I think, you know, for people kind of like what you said, watching something like, I can't believe like, they're just sitting around a fire, like laughing and cracking jokes on each other after this crazy thing happened. It's like, yeah, the, you know, people are shockingly resilient at how yep. quickly they can revert to like group norms, even yeah. under these crazy circumstances. I think that phrase people are shockingly resilient will be the theme of all of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so I think mostly like Misty and Shauna kind of figure stuff out right away in that immediate evening. And then it kind of settles down and it becomes clear that they're going to be there for a bit longer than they expected. And now we're in that like second stage of survival. Yes. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Where it starts to become like, how do we make this present circumstance work? Right. Mm -hmm. Especially not knowing how long we're going to be in it. And I think about people that I've worked with that have been through not so much like what these girls have been through, but let's say, you know, the, the loss of a loved one or even like, like different types of things, like the loss of a job where it's like, okay, I'm in this new phase of my life. It's Mm -hmm. uncomfortable, painful. I don't maybe understand or, or I'm not happy about how I got here, but now I have to deal with this reality. Yeah. Yeah. And we see them doing that in different ways, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so I think like one way that we see is very similar to kind of what we were talking about before is some people take action and some people don't. So, and yes. one thing that you had said, and I can't remember if you said it on the pod or to me before, but that the people's, the characters stay really consistent in the way that they engage, no matter like what, at what period of time they're represented. Um, And I think that's true, right? We just kind of mentioned like some of the people who step up right after the crash are Ty, Shauna, Misty. And those are the ones that end up kind. Oh, and I think Natalie does too. And those are the ones that step up in this kind of sustained survival period. Because, you know, when someone needs to shoot, despite her history with a gun, Natalie ultimately is able to get over it, that yeah. thing with her dad, and then is able to be the gun carrier, right? Shauna yeah. steps up and is the one that's willing to learn how to kill and skin an animal. Ty frequently is stepping up kind of like general leadership roles. Um, mm-hmm. Misty is always stepping up with something usually medically related. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, so we, we, we see them kind of taking their different roles, and that's very much con uh, contrasted with um, someone like Jackie, who mm -hmm. is just kind of going with the flow of everyone else, and, and I think very much sees herself as, uh, like, this, I, I'm not about this, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, like this is not me. I'm not a survival person. Like, I want to go back to, to dances and back to my bedroom and... Um, all these different kinds of things and yeah. references that she, you know, connects with Shauna on. Meanwhile, they're all looking at her like, uh, why aren't you contributing more? And I think uh -huh. as a as a group dy dynamic, that's also really interesting because yeah. it kind of says to me the sort of varying levels of acceptance that they're able to find mm -hmm. of the circumstance they're in. Mm -hmm. And how they kind of adapt to that as a result, right? Because every time they find something that makes their circumstances a little bit easier, right? They find the lake, then they find the cabin, you know, and then they try to explore out from there. Um, you know, they they develop the ability to hunt, all these sorts of things. You see them becoming more and more competent or even confident mm -hmm. about sort of how long they can manage yeah, under these the circumstances. Level. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's very interesting yes. um, is Jackie is the captain, right? She's the captain yep. of the soccer mm -hmm. team. And the coach actually has a discussion with her about why she's the captain. And basically what it boils down to is social currency, right? I think he used the word mm -hmm. influence. But what I really like about that kind of comparison is the thing about social currency is it really depends on the circumstances, how much that is worth. And so sure. yep. when you are in a fairly affluent school where you all have your needs met and the only thing that really matters is soccer, then having social currency is like the most powerful thing. It's the thing that keeps yep. them together. It's the thing that motivates them. It's the thing that leads them. When you land, crash in the middle of nowhere, being the person that's like, okay, guys, turn to the person next to you and tell them what you like about them. D that right. currency has lost all value. And in the moment where Shauna tries to kind of encourage her to use that in an effective way, she creates a, was it a game or, the, or is she the one that does the dance? Well, yeah. Jackie. So, so the, that, that's eventually like the role that I kind of wished and was hoping she would embrace more is just like, I'm in charge of fun. Like yeah. I'm in charge of keeping people's spirits up and doing interesting things and helping distract people. Like if she just fully embraced that, I think they would have responded to that positively because every time she said like, Hey, let's play a game or let's talk about this or let's plan this doom. What do they call it? Doom coming. Oh, uh -huh. You know, they were all about it. And it created really positive opportunities for them all to connect, but it just it just never felt like Jackie really saw that as a, a, a role she could consistently fit into as much as it was just like something she fell into out of desperation. And also it really felt like she was trying to make everything the way that it was rather than trying to make things work where they are. So she's like, well, we missed homecoming or prom or something like that. So let's have our own dance, yep. which I think ultimately was like a cool activity, right? Like the activity itself mm -hmm. was great, but it almost kind of felt like Jackie was being like, how can we make this an environment where I feel normal? <laughs> yeah. And the place where she feels normal is where she is homecoming queen or where she is prom queen, For right? Sure. And they're still teenagers, right? And I think we kind of forget that yeah. a little bit, although they do a very good job at like helping us remember that they're teenagers. But so they, they're still teenagers. And so those moments are a lot of fun for them. And I think you're right. Like I think if, if Jackie had been able to, and I think this is where she fell short, be a follower for some of it, those moments where she was a leader would have been more meaningful because the issue with her was not that she wasn't taking charge, but it's that like in the moments where other people were taking charge, she was just not doing anything. And so people yeah. were kind of like, we're working really hard here and you're sitting there doing nothing. And I think it's because she was like, 
all I have is social currency and that's been taken from me. So I've got nothing to offer. Yeah. And, and, you know, we see, uh, the, the other four main girls and how those skills that they developed, you know, translated into adults. And that's, that's sort of something that I was really fascinated by as well. Cause we see Shauna, right. For example, Mm -hmm. um, she becomes this person who's, you know, adept with a knife and mm-hmm. cut and, and, and cut and cut and skin animals. And then she does that as an adult. And and it seemed like when she did, when she, you know, did what she did to the rabbit from the garden, it felt like we were seeing this different, more confident, stronger side of her, not which I would, which I was sort of half expecting this sort of like traumatized, shamed, like broken person like she was really leaning into like, no, this is what got me through those 19 months or whatever it was. Uh And I feel good when I do this. Yeah. I would argue that it is a trauma response though. And the reason why. Oh yeah, no, no, not, not, I guess not disputing that more, just more just the, the sense of competency that we saw from her as opposed to like, maybe as compared to Nat, let's say, right? So Nat, and and for for some good reasons, Nat obviously traumatized by this experience in different Mm -hmm. ways. You know, the person that she developed this relationship with, obviously they had some falling out. She had addiction issues, but she also, sorry? Her addiction issues before, during, and after. Yes, of course. Yeah, Yeah, and, and, you know, we see uh, sort of Nat's, competencies you know as an adult are are unique in their own way right she how to describe nat i mean she's gosh i think she's highly competent (laughs) yeah no well it was it was impressive in the way that she was sort of like aggressively moving forward to try to solve you know solve some of this mystery where these postcards coming from like what happened to travis i gotta find him all these things so i think there was something um really uniquely positive about how she was coping of course obviously as you mentioned some of her trauma response most strongly showing up in her addiction behaviors yes absolutely i think her character i think that's another character where um very consistent between the the teenage representation and the adult representation, because the way that she engages with people as both a teen and as an adult are very caring and compassionate and like seeing them for who they are, even when they don't say it. And I think what we see between the teenage version and the adult version is a life that's been hard. Not that her life as a teenager hadn't been hard because that had already been hard, but we see that as well in that character, right? A lot of defenses, kind of tough girl, and she is drinking and hanging out in the alleyways, but she still has that really young spirit of like hope. Yeah. (laughs) And then we see the adult version, which is so consistent with that teen version, just like add 20 years of trauma and turning to substance use and abuse to manage it but that same seeing people and loving them and caring like like even the way that she connects with misty is like yep loving and compassionate within like shells and shells of barriers but still like i thought that one of the best relationships on the show i thought (laughs) i i just can't imagine any relationship with misty being great no i guess relationships the wrong word like one of the the best sort of inter-character dynamics (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, i love natalie like she the teen version and the adult version i think like they're my people like very very cool um character representation there and i think very accurately uh grown up in terms of like demeanor Yep. With what we know, right? And there's a lot that we don't know as well. Interesting. For sure. Yeah. And and speaking of things that we don't know about people, Misty has to be one of the most confusing, confounding characters. You know. <laughs> she is wild. Well, yeah, and, and it's like at different parts, it's like, is Misty the villain? And it's uh-huh. like not quite. But oh, she's but, also, but also not, not great. Not. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right, right, right. There's definitely, and I like would have to know so much more, but there's definitely some 
disordered personality stuff there, right? Like the inability to read social cues, but also can also hyper yeah. read social cues. Also like the, like using manipulation to form relationships, but then also. Yeah. That was one of the, really that was one of the things I was most fascinated by because I do think, you know, in that first day, right. So she, she comes into action, right. With all of her first aid skills and, um, and she overhears the other girls saying basically like, thank God for Misty. Uh huh. We'd be lost without her. Which is true. And I, I think she was like the survival. Uh, it might be true. Right. I mean, she, she, she kept coach Ben alive, you know, although she invariably also poisoned him on multiple occasions. So yes. <laughs> kind of, well, a, I mean, in that initial survival, uh, a period, mixed bag like there. they would not have made it through without her yes. in that initial crash period. Yeah. So, but like we talk about sometimes like the lessons that people learn from traumatic experiences. Right. So Misty, mm-hmm if we had to like boil it down to like, what did Missy learn from that first 24 to 48 hours? And it's like, Oh, if I help people in a specific way, they will like love, accept, want me around. Right. Mm -hmm. But then she twists that into, I have to stay in this role. How can I stay in this role where people want me around? Mm -hmm. And she, and I mean, when one of the, things that on one hand I understand like that her character is sort of made out to be we don't know what her personality is but like to break the the black box and essentially turn off the beacon that probably would have gotten them saved yeah I forgot about that was such a fascinating yeah 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 like finally here they see me well, yeah, no, it's just, you know, you, you can see her internal logic. Like, oh, I'm sure we'll still be rescued, but I'm going to enjoy this, like, being the leader, being the pe- person that everyone's going to lean on, and, and we're just going to survive because I know what to do. But then it goes from that to, like, oh, no, now we're surviving with Coach Ben's leadership or with Ty's leadership. Like, I still need to basically take care of someone. Yep. Yeah, no, she's literally every episode I have a different note about Misty and it's always in all caps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think she has this intense need to be needed, right? And mm-hmm. yep. and it shows up in different ways as the teenager versus the adult. But what's also wild is that like Sometimes it seems like she's completely unaware, right? So with Coach, for example, like it appears as though she's completely unaware that he is not interested in her, that like they don't have a relationship. She's completely unaware of the role that she plays within the the team. But then as an adult, when she's forming the relationship with the investigator that she has kidnapped that same kind of thing pops up, you know, like, Oh, she is completely unaware that what their relationship is. But then when it ends, right. And she has now killed this woman. It's like, Oh no, she was aware the whole time. So then it's like, wait a minute. Where, when is, and this is the thing that I'm talking about where it's like, she oscillates between like hyper awareness of social engagement and also under awareness perfect example is like her relationships at the care facility where she works. She, um, it almost feels like she plays dumb, right? Like she's like, Oh my gosh, I'll see you guys on Monday. I'll bring donuts. And they're like, okay, Misty, whatever. But then we know that she's doing that because she's actually stealing stuff from the clinic. And it constantly feels like she's kind of intentionally playing dumb in order to get them to actually not look at her. But that's not the feeling that we get when she's a teenager. Um, it, she, We could probably like close our eyes and flip through the DSM and whatever page it lands on, we could probably give her that <laughs> diagnosis. Yeah, well, because, right, because some of the, the other behaviors carry through to her adulthood, right? You know, she 
so she can help Nat. She like, and this happened. <laughs> she like takes something out of the oh car so it won't yeah. start, which, which I didn't realize. But she also did to like her own car, so her date, her really awkward date, would have to take her home. And it's like the extent that she was willing to go to <laughs> to further connect with anyone. They're like, there was no limit, right? No. So it's like Nat needs help or Ty needs help. Like I'm willing to kidnap like so-and-so needs this, you know, and to her credit, I guess, at least in the initial aftermath, like she did take very decisive action that was needed to yeah. save Coach Ben's life and things like that. But at some point that translated into manipulation. Yeah, absolutely. And what I was going to say is that like, she's always right. She knows that. So she said to Ty, Ty's like, why did you like rip this out of my car? She's like, you wouldn't have let me go with you otherwise. Which like, yep. yeah, so she's 100% correct. Facts. Um, yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, a lot of the work that I do, I say like, I don't really care what choices you make as long as they have a valued function. And in Misty's mm -hmm. case, like, all of her choices have a valued function. The thing is, they are wild values. <laughs> and also, yep. like, morally questionable and ethically questionable, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a whole other story. But that's what's so interesting about her is that, like, she is correct. Like, every time she has, like, a an idea or a plan, she is, like, accurate about how it needs to be done, what needs to be done who can do it, how it can be done. It's incredible. Yeah, it really Wild. is. Um, so she's she's a, a great character. <laughs> and and character. I'm grateful for her in the show in the uh -huh. sense that it's like a complete wild card, but yeah. also terrifying. Yeah. All right, so we've talked about Shauna, Misty, Nat. Um, I think we have to talk about Ty as well, who is having a, a, a unique long-term and and also in the media term um response to this trauma in the sense that she's she would call it sleepwalking i think we might call it something else she's absolutely fugue stating <laughs> yeah so right she's so could, could you explain for the audience what what we are talking about when we say yeah. that so a dissociative fugue um also known as a psychogenic fugue or fugue state is this like sudden unexpected like movement away from someone's like home or location or experience. And then when they come to, or when they return, they have no memory of that thing happening. Also, oftentimes in those fugue states, if you are, so she's not aware in her fugue states, right. but some people can be. And when people who are essentially, oh, quote unquote, awake during their fugue states, they can't remember their main self. Um, so they can only remember who they are right now in this moment, but that's not her case. Her case is these like quote unquote sleepwalking moments where she wakes up somewhere doing something, <laughs> yep. whether it's she falls asleep watching the fire and then she wakes up in a tree um, while the other teammates are getting attacked by wolves or she wakes up outside her son's room eating dirt yep. and she doesn't know how she got there or what happened or even what she's doing in that moment. Yeah. And it's before we know the full extent of her fugue states, all we hear is about her son, Sammy's sort of experience of this quote unquote bad one, right? Yeah. This woman, outside the window in the tree that he you know you're the good one mommy yeah, yeah that he draws pictures of and puts on the window and keeps the shades closed and is clearly terrified and and we i would assume he knows it's her right because mm -hmm. he sees her but maybe because he's a pretty emotionally aware child despite the conditions that he's in doesn't say to her like it's you <laughs> well he doesn't think it's her like, I think he thinks that because he well, said, I guess like, that's right. Probably. Like, I think yeah. he thinks it's a bad monster that looks like mom. Right. And that's why sure. he says you're sure, the sure. good yep. one. Right. Like, you're the good yeah, one that's of fair. you. Yeah. But I think mm -hmm. um, 
one thing that I always say whenever somebody, particularly a child, but whenever somebody is saying like that they are scared of something, right? So in this case, yep. like I'm scared of the, the woman outside the window or I'm scared I'm being followed or I'm scared my house is bugged. Within yep. reason, I always say like, well, first let's check to see if there's a woman outside the window. <laughs> Before we start treating the child for some like trauma, let's see mm -hmm. if there's a woman outside their window. Or before we start treating someone for paranoia, let's find out if somebody is following them. <laughs> and even if we can't get that answer, right? Like the first step is always like, well, check to see if it's happening. <laughs> and granted, they could not necessarily have checked for him because it was her, <laughs> right? And so, you know, Right. Every time they checked, she would not have been there. But I do think that that's a, like a very good rule when you're like working with your children is, you know, if they say like, there's a man in the closet, well, check if there's a man in your closet. That's right. Yep. Now, obviously, nine out of 10 times, it's going to be like childish uh, or childlike fears. And that's totally normal. Mm -hmm. But that's always the first step. It's like, well, if you're scared of something, see if that thing is happening. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and and the more we see of the extent to which Ty is, you know, struggling with these symptoms that are outside of her control, you know, the more we worry not just about her but her son and I think, you know, what what they end up doing, um Ty and her wife end up basically separating because of these very intense experiences and meanwhile she is running for Senate or running for uh -huh. yeah, political Senator. office of New Jersey. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting, you know, because I think that also fits with the teenage Ty who in the midst of all yeah, of this 100%. trauma is trying to take leadership positions, right? Mm -hmm. Is trying to sort of direct the group, is trying to save the group, is trying to venture off into the wilderness despite the risks. Yeah. And despite the risks, she continues to run for this political office as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a um, another example of a very accurate teen to adult trajectory because if we remember the first time we really see ty as an experience in the show is when she is talking about the uh what was her name Allie, the freshman whose leg ultimately gets broken and ally base or uh ty is basically like she choked during our last game we cannot have that happening what do we need to do to make sure that this goes well and basically, yep. she takes a leadership role of do whatever it takes to win at anyone's expense, which is very much the role she takes as a politician. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, she does try to keep her co opponent's family and and the dirt that she has on him out of it until he kind of starts attacking her and her family. And then it sounds like she's more willing to take that role. Yeah. But yeah, we definitely see that, right? We see that on the soccer team. We see that when they are in survival mode. And then we see that as an adult, these very like business, like, I don't care who gets in the way, what needs to be done. And it kind of makes sense because she's the one it feels that has the least relationship with the other three. I mean, none of them are friends, but she's right. the one that seems the most separated until we start to see that like actually she and... Shauna got closer when they were out there. And then also that kind of yeah. gets reignited a little bit as these um, episodes go on, um, which I think is a nice. Yeah. And that's like some of the, the complex nature of this, this dynamic, because we, we learned over the course of the season that Ty hired the investigator uh -huh. that was, you know, trying to interview the other girls. Mm -hmm. um, the one that Misty eventually murders. Yeah. Misty. <laughs> So it does establish this dynamic, and that, I'll, as far as we can tell, that journalist unfortunately did die. I'm assuming, but we don't know but for sure. Man, but we think so. Yeah, we can we can assume. Mm -hmm. But you know that sort of mistrust, right? Of because she's trying to, you know, reach Run political office, office yeah. she wants some sense of reliability of. You know, are are these other people who have also been through a traumatic experience going to be uh, a risk for me? Mm -hmm. Never mind the risk I am to my own self or my own child and wife. 
Yeah, well, and it also seems that like until these things started happening, right, the postcards and the murder and all yep. those things, she was doing fine. Um, it seems like a lot of them were doing fine, but these fugue states and her trauma was brought up again by these things being reintroduced and all of that. And yeah, and then makes it kind of dangerous. Yeah. You know, so those are just the four main adults. And I think, you know, at different points, they all sort of acknowledge like they're all not doing great, right? Mm -hmm. In different ways. And and that's manifesting itself in different ways. Even, you know, someone like Shauna, who, you know, has these sort of survival skills and, you know, her, you know, her relationship with her husband and her daughter is in shambles in many yeah. ways. So, you know, these sort of trauma responses can have so many different types of long lasting effects. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And she murders that dude. <laughs> I forgot well, about I was that. Say, yeah, so, so, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you that, brought that up because, <laughs> because the whole time there was this sort of conversation around who this guy, Adam was, yeah. right? One bright is light. he, right. Is he like just a, just a dude, right. Mm -hmm. That like was hitting on a, a married woman. Is he, I, my favorite theory was that he was Shauna's, uh, forest baby oh funny somehow like aged up uh you know that age actually that would have been a, a fairly accurate right <laughs> right like he could have been like 30s and she was 40s like early 30 i don't know i guess yeah it's I, not well, that either but it could way. have been yeah well right but i think that's what trauma does to people is that like oh my god they went through this crazy thing like obviously this guy wouldn't just be attracted to her sort of he must be connected to the trauma and there's like this paranoia of these these experiences where like nothing good can be good on its own and it turned mm -hmm. out that he was just a guy he yeah. was just a guy that was interested in her and yeah obviously he probably googled her at some point and, and as he said he got the book but that was more than enough information for shauna to kind of tell this story to herself that uh -huh. he was a threat to her yeah absolutely we create our own personal narratives whether it's a trauma narrative that's or, right or just the narrative of i can't go to that party because they don't really want me there yep we yep. create our own narratives and we take them as truth rather than recognizing that thoughts are just thoughts our narratives are just narratives it's our actions and our engagements with the world that really impact our world and affect how our world actually yeah. is yeah and despite our best efforts to establish those narratives right the world will often not cease in reminding us of those events that we've experienced mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so so you pointed this out earlier and i think that this is a very common experience for people who have been through trauma is like other people not wanting to let it go. And we saw lots of examples of this with all the different characters. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, one thing that keeps happening is as they are later on in life, people are constantly being like, oh my God, you're one of them. Or did you guys really eat yep. people out there? Or tell me what really happened, right? Ty sees it a lot from people trying to like, yep. I'll sponsor you in this run if you tell me what really happened, um, mm -hmm. things like that. And, and I think that happens a lot with stories that are sensationalized. Um, you know, I have seen it with um, people who have survived other experiences in our world and, and seen interviews mm -hmm. with them where they're like, you know, it's, 25 years since that happened to me and people are still remembering yep. me as the person that that happened to. Yep. And that's really, it's so true, right? Like every single time yep. somebody brings it up, they have to relive their trauma and they also have to like in a socially acceptable way, like, brush those people off without them being the ones that seem rude. And I think that's wild, but it's how our world works, yeah. right? Like if these four 100%. women had basically, you know, put up their middle finger and told people to go F themselves, they would look like the rude ones when really like, that's actually the appropriate response to somebody nosing into your trauma, which I think is incredible. And it says something more about us as people than anything else. Well, yeah, and and the the incredibly awkward 
uh, mm -hmm. brunch with Shauna and Jeff and Jackie's parents. I thought it was a perfect example uh -huh. of this, right? Where they are celebrating Jackie's birthday, however mm -hmm. many years later after she died. Mm -hmm. And and Jackie's parents, I mean, I don't know. To me, it felt like are just sort of stuck as if it happened oh, a month or a year 100%. ago. Yeah, they haven't right? even changed her bedroom. The bedroom's the same, yeah. the stories are the same, all that stuff. Yeah, well, Sean is the one being put in that position of like, we're we're re talking about this person and, and then we find out later in the in the season, like an episode later, Shauna may very well feel at, to be at blame for Jackie's yeah. death. Hundred percent. She definitely feels involved in some way in the death. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's super interesting. And she also like she was her best friend. Right. So there yeah. It, yeah. what I think is also very interesting is she doesn't engage with like, oh my God, I have to keep up this facade that she was my best friend. She is kind of able to hold both, both, you know, I can't talk about it. I don't want to think about it. Also, she was my best friend. I think that moment when she saw her daughter walking through the club with Jackie's uniform on, yeah, that should have had more of an emotional reaction than it did, I think, because that would have been, I think like a horrific moment. Um, but also another example of how people bring up other people's traumas, right? Like that would be a Halloween costume for someone. Yes. It's awful. Yeah. That's sort of a perfect segue into like the incredible like high school reunion. Yeah. That's where also I was where yeah. it's like, yeah, it's where, you know, so we have Nat and Misty and Ty and Shauna and they all essentially go together mm -hmm. After chopping up a body. To this event where they have to know, right? They have to know that they're going to be stared at yeah. and, and whispered about. And they were. But not only that, but... Oh, God. And I thought it was so ironic and probably really well done in some sense that the, the freshman girl who uh -huh. would have been on the plane was uh -huh. like the one that organized the whole like terrible PowerPoint presentation and, and Can story. Can I give my and, thoughts about oh that real gosh. quick? So please, I think please. if you are that person, right, where you are like, oh my gosh, if I had not broken my leg, I would have been on that plane. You have yes. your own kind of trauma in that like kind of survivor guilt kind of stuff, but also like you would be brushed aside and people wouldn't think about the effect that that almost had on you. The fact that it, that the almost definitely had on you. And I almost see this, her being like, this is how I involve myself in the middle of this story is by organizing this event and highlighting you guys and putting on this slideshow of, of all of you. Like, it's almost like, look, I am part of it too. And almost like that's how she kind of works through her stuff associated mm -hmm. with probably no one ever caring about her feelings about it well and even the way they talked about it you know and they, it was a lot of references to this idea that we all went through this as a uh -huh. class uh -huh. right so not even just the people that were on the plane but the whole class the whole school the whole community having quote-unquote gone through this together which is true and, and right of course of course it's true but it's also mm -hmm. taking something away yeah. from the actual well, survivors of this experience. So absolutely. it's just such a complex. Yeah. So I think that kind of language is absolutely true. Like we as a community, blah, blah, blah. However, I also think that like you need to realize that your trauma is not their trauma, right? So an example right. would be like a, a bombing somewhere, right? Like that whole community comes together yep. and says like, this happened to our community. However, the people who lost loved ones or who had limbs that were injured or things like that, like their trauma does look different and that needs to be honored. And I think you're right. Like that wasn't honored. And it almost felt like particularly at this event, um, this, I think her name was Allie. This Allie was like, really trying to be like, I was a part of it too, because like she was kind of, she just wasn't a part of like oh, she totally the main was. traumatic yeah, and, and, and like the whole, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think, you know, there was something about like putting the spotlight on them, making Shauna and Jeff dance mm -hmm. uh, as if Shauna was Jackie. I mean, there was just a, a level to it that was beyond cringeworthy. It was like I was was painful um, as an audience member to watch. Yeah, no, it was that was horrific. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think um, before we like start to wrap up, I think one thing that was yeah, yeah. really meaningful is that um, they've just chopped up this human body and gotten it cremated and disposed of it. Right. Yep. And then they all get dressed up and they show up and outside one of them goes, this is the most scary thing I've done all day. And I think that that line is probably so true because I think, and we actually didn't even have time to like get into this, but I think it goes into that survival psychology and mm -hmm. fear and anxiety changes with context and experience, right? So I don't think that these girls had that much time to be scared or anxious or worried or any of those things while they were surviving oh, sure. because literally every day it was just like what's the next move and so i think it makes sense that like the two emotions are survival right and what does that take and then social stress and i think those are kind mm -hmm. of the only two things these girls experience when they're out there the three men that were there too but the girls mostly and then when you get back to the real world, like re-entry, trauma re-entry psychology is such a huge thing. We we see it, people who have been like kidnapped and kept in like a room their whole life or people mm -hmm. who have been through something like this and come back or all sorts of like engagements like that where people are like... Oh, I think another really good one is people who have been in prison their whole life and then get released. Oh, sure. Um, and now it's a whole yep. new world and they're just kind of expected to be like grateful that they're free, but really like it's a different world. Like you're a different person. And I like, I truly think in those situations, pulling a rabbit out of your garden and skinning it and cooking it for dinner not as scary as putting on a dress and heels and walking into a room of your high school peers, which I think we can all agree is scary on its own. Absolutely. <laughs> what, you know, whether you've been through a plane crash or not. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're so right. Right. Like the idea and even like the scene where they're just able to kind of joke and casually take the body apart into the bathtub mm -hmm. of Shauna's, you know, boyfriend. Mm-hmm is like they're they're totally casual and numb to the act that they are having uh -huh. to commit in that moment but the social awkwardness is much more painful and much more intense for them yeah and i think that that kind of tells you everything that they need to know that that when you've been through trauma like your threshold for what is scary or what is painful or what is worthy of an anxiety response is just completely recalibrated yeah entirely. in a way that you really do have to find a way to adapt to and obviously mm -hmm. the the women do or don't in in really interesting ways and i'm i'm excited for where this series is going to go i was expecting to get much further in the yeah. fact that we had a whole season and only got a couple months into you know their survival, survival yeah yeah, super interesting. I, I'll talk about it in my rating. <laughs> well, yeah. So why yeah. don't why don't we jump right into that? Because I yeah. think um, what we may do, because I have I have uh, one sort of sideways fun thing I want to talk about with this show. Instead of doing that now, let's let's review Yellow Jackets because I think we've yeah. got some um, some different things to to break down about what our thoughts are about this show so far. Yeah. So on a scale from one to five very awkward tribute slideshows how um accurate do you feel like the mental health representation was in yellow jackets i mean it's so all over the map because we unfortunately didn't get, didn't to, get to talk much about lottie i know yeah well so that's, that's who i wanted to mention right because 
when shows take the sort of borderline between psychosis and is this uh, actually like a supernatural thing? Uh-huh. I really struggle with that. Yeah. Now, I don't know how they're going to resolve it. Yeah. Um, but right now it's being treated as is is Lottie quote unquote crazy and mm-hmm. just, you know, a schizophrenic or, or this or that? Or does she have some sort of like supernatural sense? She can see the future. She can interact with animals in weird ways. Like what's going on with her? Yeah. Or both. Spirits, whatever it might be. Culture plays a huge or role exactly. in or both. the ability to see things. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to to know in a sense, like how seriously the show is treating this mm-hmm. or is it just going to, are there just going to be supernatural elements to this show yeah. much like lost, for example, yeah. that are just not going to be explained. Yeah. absolutely. So when that's happening for me, that has to affect the the accuracy just in the sense that we don't know how they're treating this yet. Uh-huh. So for now, I'll just grade it on season one. Man, so much of it was pretty good, especially the things that we just mentioned. But so much of it was just so much also like all over the map that I think the best I can do for season one is like a 3.9, 3. 3.9 out of 5. Okay, yeah. Because I'm, I'm worried about some aspects of it. Uh-huh. But some of it was really good. Even like the scenes early on that we saw Nat in you know, in a very expensive uh, uh, addiction center Mm -hmm. was pretty on point. Mm -hmm. So some of that stuff I really liked um, and some of it's sort of still yet to be played out. And there was just too little emotional reaction across the board. Like no matter what was happening, nobody was freaking out about it enough at at any point. Like the the daughter of Shauna to the girls seeing – van's face ripped apart by wolves like nobody oh was gosh. ever reacting yeah, yeah. Enough, um which is was wild so yeah i think 3.9 makes sense okay well in that case let's see on a on a scale of one to five uh fantastic musical references such as this is how we do it by montel jordan um <laughs> And some other really good ones. How entertaining did you find uh, season one of Yellow Jackets? I kind of think that this is hard to answer. And the reason why is because the first four episodes, I was 100% on board. And I was like very excited about it. And then like five through 10 started being the like supernatural kind of stuff, um, which... Mm -hmm. I enjoy as well to an extent, but I'm a little bit disappointed by that happening because I was really enjoying like the realistic. The grounded nature. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Of like what happened to these girls. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really like intrigued to see like kind of Lord of the Flies esque, like how did social psychology lead yep. to them in a ritualistic way? potentially eating this person that died at the very beginning. Yeah. Um, we don't know, but yeah. probably. Um, and I think that like I was very on board for that. And then when it um, got super supernatural, then I was like less invested in it. Um, and then it started getting just like a little bit kooky and weird. And so that bumped the points down for me. So um, fantastic song references. I think 3.9 is accurate too. Enjoyable. I was constantly engaged, like what happens next. I'm excited to get answers, even though I'm less excited about the plot. (laughs) Um, So 3.9. Totally. It's, it is a very sort of bingeable, like pulpy show, right? You're going to be shocked by gore and like emotional drama, but it's also like, oh my God, like how do they actually survive for 19 months? Who survives? So it's, mm-hmm. there's definitely some really interesting things yet to be played out. Um, yeah. Does she have her baby? That I'm looking forward to, to seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, Ryan, do you want to tell them what they will be able to? hear from us yeah so well so one of the things i'm I'm really sort of curious about talking to you about a little bit more that we'll put up is just sort of like what does it say about us the audience that we are fascinated by things like 
cannibalism or Mm -hmm. zombies or, you know, these types of like scary adjacent things. Mm -hmm. And especially when they are interwoven with mental health um, themes. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So so we're going to talk about that. and That'll be up at some point. So if you're curious about that sort of like bigger, headier topic, feel free to, to subscribe. Um, and thank you all for listening. We appreciate it a million. Please, please, please rate, review and subscribe. It helps us a ton. Share it and let us know what topics you're interested in. And, and as always, feel free to follow us on all of our social medias at poppsych101. Thank you all for listening, and we hope to be talking at you again soon. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>